You're listening to Fit Pro Sessions with Parallel Coaching, episode three. Hi, I'm Neil Bergman, and in today's podcast, I'm talking to Phil Quirk from PQ Performance about the power of mindset. We also discuss belief, intention, and confidence, as well as how blueberry bubblegum and sleep are the secret source to reducing your stress and improving your memory. Hi, I'm Neil Bergman. And I'm Hayley Bergman. Over the last 10 years, we've helped thousands of fitness professionals to get qualified, learn with simplicity, and coach clients with confidence. We're the first to say that learning and being a fit pro doesn't have to be hard work, and that with the right structure, support, and resources, you can become a confident and knowledgeable fitness professional that is dedicated to more. So how do you learn, qualify, and kickstart as a fit pro? This is the Fit Pro Sessions podcast with Parallel Coaching. Phil is a leading high performance NLP coach specializing in NLP and hypnosis. He's worked with Olympians, world champions, as well as top CEO executives, as well as teaching NLP practitioner and master practitioner courses worldwide. Phil is a true expert. Phil and I had so much to talk about and discuss that this episode, episode three, is actually part one. And you can join us on part two, which will be episode nine of the Fit Pro Sessions, uh, due to come out in a couple of weeks' time, where we'll discuss and go on to talk about career change, a deep dive into NLP, and also answer some Facebook learner questions from the Parallel Coaching community. I hope you enjoy today's session, and here we go. So first off, Phil, I want to welcome you to Fit Pro Sessions. Uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, let's just jump straight in with... Uh, Tell us more about Phil Quirk. Tell us more about who, who you are and, and, and where, you are, where you've come from. Tell us a bit about the backstory, Phil. Yeah, so, oh, wow, the backstory. So, the um, backstory. <laughs> uh, it depends on how far we go back. Uh, uh, if in a real sort of truncated way, I, I, I joined the Marines um, at a fairly young age, sort of 18, 19 years old, and went off. Joined the Marines. Um, uh, it, it was more a necessity thing than anything else. I, I, I can't say that I always had a... a a lifelong ambition to join the Marines. I was just getting into so much trouble at home. Um, I just had to go and do something um, constructive rather than destructive, which is pretty much what I was doing up to that age. Um, the Marines was great for me. It, it shaped my character, um, gave me a set of values and an ethos, taught me about the importance of discipline. It was probably without realizing that at the time, it was where I first understood mindset and, and how mindset will always beat physical attributes um uh, there, there was a guy in the bed that was next to me in training that was probably one of the most incredible physical specimens i've ever seen in my life you know it, just an insane human that had almost been like a universal soldier sort of thing from hollywood um and he, he was for the first six weeks of our training he could do everything there was nothing he couldn't do and nothing was hard um, and then we did uh, dunker drills in, I think, whatever it was, week eight or nine or whatever it was, which is where you do the helicopter um, uh, helicopter escape drills in the pool. So they kind of have the simulator. They put it in a deep pool. It's freezing cold. You've got to get out the helicopter. And they, they, they have like a, a sort of a tiered approach to this where it starts off just a normal going in like that with the lights on. But at the end, it's kind of span around and it's upside down and all the lights are switched off and he couldn't escape um uh, and freaked out understandably um uh, and his head went and then on the side of the pool i kind of watched this guy who'd been unbelievable just sort of tap out he couldn't get him back in the helicopter and i, I kind of realized there that no matter how strong you are if you haven't got it in the head it doesn't really matter does it it, it just ends there so I did, the, I did the Marines, which was great. Had my first introduction to understand the mindset, like I've said, values, ethos, standards, um, the importance of, of, of looking after your oppos as well, your friends, uh, which is something that I think, you know, the, the private sector could learn a lot from, uh, in, my, in, my, in my opinion. Uh, I think in the, the difference between the military and the private sector, if you look at like the military and the corporate sector, in the military, people will sacrifice themselves for like literally nothing you know no pay no 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 bonuses and they'll sacrifice themselves for their friends whereas in the in the private sector what can happen is people will sacrifice their friends for it's large the bonuses way around <laughs> <laughs> um but so so the marines was great like that i left the marines uh 2004 um i, I was never going to stay in for life if i'm honest um i had a few years of not doing much again 
kind of expected when I when I left the Marines, I'd, I'd walk out the gates and there'd be loads of people waiting there to give me a job, which wasn't the case, obviously. Um, uh, and I found that difficult. Uh, and then eventually I decided to join the RAF, which I think was a, which was, was a great move for me personally. Um, I became a physical training instructor in the RAF, first of all, um, as you know, so in the white vest as a PTI. But I, I very, very quickly realized that, that, you know, maybe it was a succession of the seeds that were sown when I was in the Marines, that the physical side of stuff was great, but it was really what was happening in the top three inches that fascinated me. And the RAF was fantastic because it gave me the opportunity to go on an incredible amount of courses and do an incredible amount of learning and self-development. Um, and really, my focus very quickly became what, what happens in someone's head. Um, and I realized once I started to understand some of the principles that I teach now, and once I started to adopt them into my coaching, it was transformational because I could say things to clients um, and they would have light bulb moments and that would create change. Whereas opposed to some of, you know, perhaps my colleagues that would just be very much about discipline and, 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 and shouting at people and in the gym, which is what I used to be like, to be honest with you. Um, you know, they would get very little long-term change with that approach. Um, uh, and then after the RAF, uh, I, I set up my first business, um, which was, which I had for five years, Pronoctus. Um, which was an incredibly successful business. We, 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 you know, our first contract was doing mindset training with Barclays Bank across three continents in the world. You know, we, you know, we walked into Canary Wharf, me and my business partner with, you know, 119 pound Burton suits on, um, went to the top floor um, and, and really won a contract that we should never really have won. We didn't have any clients. We didn't have any success stories. Um, but but we believed in what we were doing and we were offering something different. And that, that, that was a great lesson for me in business that no matter what position you're in, you know, the David and Goliath analogy, um, if, you've, if you've got something of real value to offer and you believe it with sincerity and integrity and the other people believe that as well, they will go for what you're, what you're offering. Um, even if you have no, barely got a website together, barely got a... Uh, you know, no, no clients to talk about, no previous accounts from the year before for due diligence. And we still managed to win that contract. So um, which was you've got the, the belief, the underpinning belief of what it is you do and you know full well you, you deliver on that. Um, yes. Yes. People, people, buy, people buy from people, don't they? And that's, yeah. now, I learned that with, with Barclays, that we weren't dealing with Barclays. We were dealing with some guys in Barclays that had the decision to make on whether or not they were going to use us for training or use another company. It wasn't Barclays Bank Global Worldwide. It was about building relationships with, you know, three people probably that would be key to making a decision. Um, and as long as we could convince those three people that what we said we were going to do, we could do, um, and we could do it better than others. It didn't matter about previous clients. Um, I've got, I've got a belief that, you know, it's from, from a good friend of mine called Craig Williams that I do a lot of work with. Money loves speed. Um, and the amount of people I know in business that have been shaping their website for the last 18 months. Yes. Um, and <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't want to release it because it's not perfect. Well, I don't, I don't work like I, I, I get it done and get it out the door. And then if I get a load of feedback that, you know, you need to change this and change that, brilliant. That's feedback and I can just get it changed. Um, money, money loves speed in my experience. And, and the danger you get, I think the danger you get into is that paralysis by analysis stage where you know what you want to do, but you spend so much time refining it and changing like tiny little bits of it. Is actually, the font, no one is ever... the font okay on the website? Is it, is yeah. it okay? Does it look okay on mobile? Where yeah. do they go after this? And yeah, the, the perfectionist takes over and there's little focus on actually what am I trying to achieve here? <laughs> Yes, yeah, and, and, and as well, focus is a, is a key word to use there, is focus on what's going to be revenue expanding stuff in my business. You know, the, the website is important, no doubt, no, no doubt about it. It's the window into whatever business you're running, you know, certainly what I do, I imagine what you do, and, and also a lot of your guys that you, you teach. So the website is important, and I'm not devaluing that, but the website, you know, you, you're earning your money when you've got clients, and unless you get the website live and then that starts to create clients, then it doesn't matter how good it looks if it's in your bedroom because it's not going to create you any value in your business. So it's, so, 
you know, Craig, Craig always taught me money loves speed. You've got, you've got a, in a, in, in a world where everything is instant and everything is so fast these days and change happens so quick, you've got to be prepared to match that speed of, of getting stuff done and getting out of the door. Um, and, and fly by the seat of your pants at times, and that's okay. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Well, well, one of the things I, I've always said, it, um, if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. So, um, so that, 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 There we so, go. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if, you're sat back and, if you're sat back and comfortable, um, c- comfort breeds um, uh, apathy as well, I think. How do you learn, qualify, and kickstart as a fit pro? This is the Fit Pro Sessions podcast with Parallel Coaching. So I want to quickly just rewind to your time in the services. So you, you've, you've yes. you entered the Marines 2004. You then went into the RAF as a PTI. And you've mentioned that the, what fascinated you most was the top three inches and the, the, the space between the left ear and the right ear and, and what's happening in someone's mindset, their, their values, their beliefs, their language. Can you yep. recall like... Uh, I'd imagine there'd be lots of memorable moments. You've done lots of courses, lots of exercises, lots of experiences, but it's a one of your most memorable times or moments where you've seen um, a mindset shift in someone for the better, that, that, that they've gone on to something and you, you were part of that or you witnessed it in the services. In, in the services. Wow. God, there's, um, I think when I was in, the, when I was in the RAF, I was, I was, I was shaping, my own sort of um, ability and capacity. Um, I think that period of that, so I did six years in the Marines and then six years in the Army, almost like half rice, half chips. Um, and I think that, I think that six years in the RAF was more about what I, about me, it's about exploring what I could do. Um, uh, I, I, I would, I specialized in the RAF as an adventure train instructor. So I'd take people climbing and kayaking and, and a lot of the guys that I worked with, they would, they would invest all their time in trying to upskill their technical qualifications so they could paddle bigger rivers and climb uh, harder climbs. Um, I was very happy with like the bare minimum qualifications and, I, and I'm very proud of that because what I was doing, I was investing my time in learning about the mindset. So going on, you know, transactional analysis course, looking at like positive psychology, NLP, hypnosis. I was looking at everything I could look at um, from a really broad spectrum. Uh, I didn't want, I never wanted to go narrow and deep. I wanted to have a a good knowledge of everything I could as opposed to like a hugely in-depth knowledge of only one strand. Um, And actually what I started to realize over that period was that that I was changing. And that that was probably the key thing was that that I was realizing that, the, 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 some of the stuff that I could do with the mindset side of things was breathtaking. I was starting to coach people. And I was getting huge change. Um, to start off with, it was, you know, just friends and family. Uh, I, I, I was, you know, cutting my teeth trying to figure out, you know, how to use all of these crazy techniques that I was learning and developing. Um, and then what I was realizing, I was getting huge success with it. Um, success breeds confidence. Um, confidence then breeds ambition. Um, once the ambition grows, you then start to think bigger. When you think bigger, you aim higher, and you kind of go like that, don't you? And it, and it expands like that. Um, and and the, the probably the biggest change that I could have affected was in myself. Um, when I started, when I started the journey, um, learning about. Uh, so if I look at NLP specifically, when I started my NLP journey it was really to sort out some stuff that was going on in my head it was to it was to get my head in the right place my curiosity was born out of you know not understanding why I thought the way I thought and why I did the things I did and why and, and the, the, the the almost the insatiable need to understand why I was so buggered up at times I was going to say <laughs> effed up but I was doing you the can podcast. swear if you want mate you can swear if you want <laughs> yeah so so my, my own fuck up my own sort of mindset you know, these glitches, these, these gremlins that existed in my mind. Um, no more so than like speaking in front of people, which I was, used to be terrified of. So I, I went on that journey to, to figure it out for myself. To and liberate yourself it, first, that allowed you to go on and help others. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 and because it worked so well for me, it gave me a huge amount of confidence in the, in the techniques. And then when you have that belief and confidence, um, I, I, 
I think I think it's like a triangle. Um, if you if you if you take an equilateral triangle and you make any side bigger, then by default all three sides grow at the same time. So so if you look at belief, intention, and confidence as a triangle, if you increase any one side of that, the other two sides go by default, and suddenly right. you start focusing. Um, and and I'm a huge believer in this. You know that that um, the that you can fo- you can focus on one side, and if you focus enough on one side, and you really get effect change, then suddenly the whole triangle grows bigger. By uh, default, and I think- two other sides have to change at some pace relative to the one you're focusing on. So if you're focusing purely on belief, and you believe in yourself, you believe what you do, the other two sides naturally grow out. That's amazing. Yes, Ca- cause and effect, isn't it? So the increase the belief increases confidence and intention increase your intention and increase belief and confidence whichever one you focus on and really put your energy into um then 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 by by default for the triangle to remain equilateral the other two have to almost be as a cause and effect default grow with it grow with the other side Um, and so i think amazing uh, uh, you know for 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 our listeners that are I'm going to just focus not just on those that are qualifying and, and, kick, and kick starting in their fitness business, but also those that are, are learning and revising their belief in that they can learn, their belief in their revision, their belief that they are going to pass, turns out to have uh, intention that they're actually going to intend to start revising and intend to do their studies and their confidence that grows with that. So that's an, yes. an amazing uh, analogy to use. You, you, you make it and you make it one of, uh, I, one of the things I've started coaching for like <laughs> it's more it's more private coaching for friends is is and it happened by accident really I coached a friend of mine his daughter um, who was str- really struggling with her a levels um, and he asked me as a favor he said can you can you work with my daughter and and help her um, and and some things, you know, I know that like when people are studying for their um, anatomy and physiology exams, that it, that it be, can be quite stressful. But some things to understand about how the brain works. The brain is significantly worse at performing when it's in stress. So when, when, when you have a stressed brain, um, you, what happens is that you have cortisol in your system. Um, a stressed brain will lower cognition. And it will lower memory access as well. And the reason for that is because the, the focus of the energy of the brain is in the, is in the emotional limbic brain as opposed to the neocortex, which is where all of your stuff is stored, all of your information. How do you learn, qualify and kickstart as a fit pro? This is the Fit Pro Sessions podcast with Parallel Coaching. So, so one of the things that I work on with people that I coach is getting their brain in the right condition to be able to perform at the best. If they're stressed out in the exam, they will perform much worse than if they're relaxed. And that isn't anything to do with their knowledge, their ret- retention of information, their ability. That's just to do with their brain isn't configured to perform. Just the same as it's, it's like saying, you know, uh, I, I want to run a 100-meter race. Um, but I'm going to turn up to it, you know, with a terrible hangover, um, exactly. I've eaten terrible food, and I'm going to start on the start line. And then when I get a rubbish time compared to what I what I want, I'm going to wonder, well, why was my time no good? Well, because my body was not in the condition to run that is optimum. Um, the brain is exactly the same, um, uh, and simple strategies uh, can actually help keep your brain in the right in the right zone like breath breath work is the window to the to the nervous system so for instance when you breathe rapid and shallow and you go so so let me let me go back so stress stress is effectively your body as this (laughs) you guys will probably know a lot of this from what they do stress is your body leaving homeostasis and the nervous system going into sympathetic Sympathetic is when everything starts to speed up, so heart rate starts to release. You start to release certain neurotransmitters, so you release a bit of neuroadrenaline, followed by a bit of adrenaline, and then followed by cortisol. And, and then that's you in a stress response. A very, very highly evolved system to deal with very, very immediate threats, lions and tigers and stuff that want to eat us. Yeah, However, sitting down at your revision on page four of the manual is, is not really a big threat when you're trying to figure out the... Uh the axial skeleton for example <laughs> no it's it's not it's definitely not going to eat yeah uh, i presume you don't have manuals that eat, eat no, the no, not, of a mo- not of a moment 
but it's the perception and this is kind of like you make a really valid point our our stress response system has only one way to to deal with stress and that's freeze flight and fight it's the sympathetic nervous system we, we haven't evolved a new way to be able to deal with the threat of uh, a tiger eating us as opposed to the threat of you know, a mortgage default as, a throw, uh, as opposed to a threat of anatomy and physiology exam. The same response for all those things. And the problem with that lies in and of that. So because we've only got one stress response and it only has one way of dealing with stress, what happens now is we no longer have the lions, which is the immediate stress, which is our, our stress response is designed as an, as an explosive system that's meant to explode and then relax. Um, just the same as you know, a zebra on the, on the savanna. When the lion starts chasing the zebra, the zebra explodes all of its resources it has to get away from the lion. It floods with endorphins, it floods with neurotransmitters. The whole nervous system becomes alive, digestion stops completely, all the blood flow is pumped into the limbs to give it maximum chance. Even if the, it's injured because of the endorphin rush around the body, it will still be able to run just as fast as if it wasn't injured. Um, and the reason for that is because the, the, the nervous system and the brain has prioritized every resource because it knows no matter how sore the leg might be, it's not as bad as getting eaten by a lion. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Now, that works amazingly for us as well. But the problem is now we've replaced that with the way we live today, which is low-level attritional constant stress. Now, if, we, if you go back to the A&P exam, the one part of the nervous system we can control is our breath that's connected. So, you know, you, you can't think and ask your heart to go slower and you can't think and ask your, your hypothalamus to switch off some of these neurotransmitters, you know, not yet anyway. Um, I don't think anyone's got, got quite that far. The Wim Hof is not it's far not, from not it. It's not far off. Something, <laughs> something we ask for or, or advise for learners to do before the exam is it will backtrack just slightly. What we see is loads of learners stand outside the exam room and they start questioning themselves, questioning others. And you might get somebody that's really confident or underconfident on, on that note and deliberately ask certain questions about certain topics which spreads yeah. this you can feel the tension yeah. you can you can hear the stress you can see the stress yeah. you can smell the fear and uh, you know we ask for our learners to you know not do that pre-exam and go off yeah. for a walk and and again that changing their physiology and just bringing their attention back to uh, uh, you know that contralateral movement and walking walk back into the exam having spoken to nobody don't stress yourself out and sit down yep. with, in, with intent yeah 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 and there, there was a lot of other things that i think you know you, you make a great point there about going for a walk if you if you look at most people before they go for a job interview and in the exam it's the same they sit on their phone outside which is obviously a very very weak position yes. now that just that body body configuration by putting yourself in that body configuration your body secret, your, your, your hypothalamus gives off the signals and you start releasing cortisol and brutal cortisol. So, so you're in a stress response by default by the position you're in. Whereas if you, if you move around and you get into an expressive position and you do what we call gravity defined body language, you, you know, you get yourself nice and big, then what you do then is you release testosterone, which is your dominance hormone, which is the opposite of the, of, of the cortisol. Um, the whole idea behind this is you want the neural activity in your brain to be in your neocortex. If you're in stress, it will be in the limbic brain. And when you think, as everyone knows intuitively, when you think emotionally, you make bad decisions, whether that be food, whether that be um, you know, on a motorway with, with road rage, we make bad decisions with high emotion. And you want the, <clears throat> excuse me, you want the neural activity to be in the neocortex. The way to do that, you're exactly right. You get yourself out, you move your body, um, you you avoid sitting in a very low power pose where you're on your phone, um, and and you you give yourself the best opportunity. So when you do go in there, your brain's in the right gear. Breathing's a big part of that as well. So so slowing the breath down and doing things like um, box breathing, uh, where you do two seconds in really slowly, hold for two seconds, two seconds exhale hold for two seconds and you do this two second loop which is obviously it's an eight second cycle of breathing in and out what that does is it takes your nervous system into parasympathetic so just by 
concentrating on your breathing, you're pulling yourself out of your sympathetic nervous system, out of your stress response, and then giving your brain the best chance. And staying in that stressed response, staying in that um, that part of the brain where, where you are stressed and you're, you're flooded with cortisol, that would explain why so many learners come out of their exam and they just say, oh, my brain just went to pop. I, I just couldn't recall anything. I was looking at the words and they didn't make sense. And I, I know I've yes. learned about the heart, but I couldn't recall anything. Um, I actually marked a paper the, the other week and I spoke to the learner after. And uh, she, she got in such a, um, a stressed state inside the exam. She literally just went down through the exam and just marked what, with, with no real um, reading the answers of, of what they were and just put answers down. And, you know, yep. she, she did refer, but she sat, she sat there after and just said, I, I just couldn't pull anything out of, out of, my, out of my brain. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's and having that, that strategy, and that sequence of events to put yourself in an environment before the exam, as you say, to put yourself into a, a state or a, a parasympathetic state to work for you. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and as, you know, as, as, well, as well, we could probably do the whole podcast on, 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 on revision and stress. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, so, so if you look at um, uh, like the brain in stress, so, so that's a prime example of someone's brain in stress. Um, sympathetic nervous system is kicked in. All of the neural activity is in their limbic brain. Cortisol is in the system. When you, when, all, all of you know. I imagine that she had no, 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 um, no appetite. Um, um, I imagine that her feet were tapping, and I imagine that, that even she could have been potentially even dry mouth and, and sweaty palms while she was in the exam as you, the stress. Prepared. You've literally just described a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in that in that stress response state, she is not going to be able to perform. Nowhere near, not even, you know, I don't know what the numbers are, but it's going to be nowhere near what she can do. So, so, uh, so breathing is a big thing for stress. It's, it's the one thing we can control at all times because obviously we're doing it nonstop. Um, you know, when you breathe rapid and shallow, that perpetuates the stress response. When you slow it down, it takes a bit of time, but what's going to happen, it's almost like taking the you, 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 your parasympathetic is like the brake on your car and your sympathetic is like the accelerator. You know, the accelerator is down. So what you do is you start to slowly take it off the accelerator and the brake on and you slow everything down and then you and focus your mind. And um, the other, other tips I give people is, 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 is hacks, like how to hack your mind. So for instance, um, anchoring yourself is a great way to do it. So with the, with the kids that I work with, with their A-levels, I tell them when they revise uh, to chew bubble gum, you know, like a uh, blueberry bubble gum. But then, then in the exam, you chew the same bubble gum, but you only ever chew the bubble gum when you revise in for A and P or you're in an exam for A and P. Now, obviously, the association of the flavor anchors yourself to remember stuff that you were doing. Um, well, there, there's so many little mind hacks you can do that help people when they're in that sort of situation. Um, but 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 we don't we don't teach it, do we? It's it's one of those things where no one seems to understand no, how the brain works. Something we, we've we've literally just started is uh, every Saturday we put something out on our Facebook Live called the Power Hour. So um, either myself or Haley for three or four minutes, um, it's recorded so that there's a series of questions to ask. Uh, anyone listening can can do it to to set up a, a thirty minute or sixty minute revision Power Hour. Because I genuinely yep. believe people sit down to revise, they get annoyed and frustrated and stressed over the fact they're not taking stuff on board, they're not instinctive learners, perhaps they believe they're too old, but they start stressing about the exam and therefore they don't structure their, their studies, um, causing even more stress. And so inside that revision time they do have, they don't learn or take anything on board because they're in that stress state. So we've put this yep. hour, hour together to kind of, eliminate all that early stress structure their that session and for them to kind of oh that was the first time i actually took some information on board how do you learn qualify and kickstart as a fit pro this is the fit pro sessions podcast with parallel coaching and yeah, i remember yeah. it yeah 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 i'm remembering the key you know because there's they're kind of two 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 trains of thought and then do we want to remember so we have the knowledge in our brains and our minds so we can use it whenever we want or do we want to remember to to do the exam and then it all gets dumped out the other side 
Exactly. Um, and the, the key to that then is understanding how the brain good, brain works. What do you want? Do you, do you want the certificate or do you really want the knowledge in there? Mm-hmm. I would hope that most, most people would go just want the knowledge. Um, now, for me, one of the things that, 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 that people don't, sometimes don't understand is, is how the brain retains information. You, you actually don't learn in the moment that you're, you're studying what you, whatever you're doing. You, you actually learn in the sleep that proceeds after it. Um, and the, the way to understand this is you, you, you've got your short-term memory, which is like a, a memory stick for, for your laptop, um, and then you've got your laptop, which has got the hard drive on it, which has got much more memory. When you're learning in the day, everything's going on to the memory stick. Now, when you do your, when you enter your circadian rhythm at night, as long as you get the right type of sleep, which is the full circadian rhythm cycles with all parts, so the light sleep, the REM, and then the non-REM sleep, the NREM. If you get three, two, well, three or four of those, which is obviously the eight hours, what happens with that memory stick is it's downloaded onto the onto the hard drive. The brain is cleaned of all of the crap that's in it, all the toxins. It basically does all its administration. It cleans off the memory stick for the next day. So this is the problem is with people, what they do when they cram for an exam, they do have the information on the memory stick, but because they, they haven't cram, downloaded it yet, <laughs> it doesn't have to get downloaded onto the hard drive. So it ends up getting dumped because it's, 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 it's all crammed onto the memory stick. Sleep is the most important thing to do when you're revising. Um, the more sleep you can get, the better, because the brain processes the information whilst the person's asleep. So you, you, you experience the learning in the day when you're sitting reading your book or you know taking part in a, in a, in a, in a Facebook Live like you mentioned. But the knowledge is downloaded in the sleep. Um, so if you pull an all-nighter before an exam, you might pass the exam, but you know that the, anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, the secret sauce to, uh, to to pass in your exam is actually just a good night's sleep. <laughs> Did you want to see the secret sauce to everything is probably a good, a good night's sleep. sleep. The, the elite athletes that I coach, you know, I they they I get I get a bit of fun because some of them call me like the sleep Nazi or the Gestapo, sleep Gestapo. <laughs> because that, I'm militant about sleep, because sleep is the number one performance enhancing game that you can get outside of doing stuff that's illegal. Um, if good quality sleep is the key to success of everything business, um, sport, revision, pretty much everything in life. Um, uh, I think most people don't fully understand or appreciate how important it is. I think appreciate is the word. Appreciate is the word. You know, having coached, you know, you know, my background of coaching, not just in parallel, but with, 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 um, end user clients, uh, in fitness, uh, in boot camp, the number one thing is, is that appreciation for sleep. You know, I've worked with hundreds of guys, um, in and around the Southwest and their appreciation for sleep is next to zero. And, yeah, wonder, yeah. and wonder why they don't perform the next day at work or in a meeting or in, the, in a relationship at home or whatever. Yeah, because they, 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 they have the perception that they've out-evolved evolution in their single lifetime. So, they, so, 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 they, so they, I, I work with you know, many, many executives. Some, a lot of the coaching I do in business is at a fairly high level of businesses, probably CEO and board level and, and around that kind of um, part. Um, and the amount of clients I've had that said, I only need four hours sleep a night. Um, and I, and I say to them, bullshit. Um, and, and I'm going to explain why with science and I'm going to leave it with you to think about, you cannot have evolved out evolved the evolutional cycle of humans over millions of years, but just because you're busy, just because yes, you've got a exactly. full day, it doesn't mean evolution doesn't negate you. Now you can survive on four hours sleep you can operate on four hours sleep and that's fine but understand that with with the brain and with physiology and with the human body like everybody knows with diet and with exercise you you, for every cause there is something that that there's a consequence for that so so for every action there is a there's a consequence so if you eat really poor food you don't really see the the consequence that day maybe not even weeks, months, but over years, you it definitely do. Toll. Yeah. And, and sleep's exactly the same thing. You know, you can, you can go years and years and years with very limited sleep, but the science is pretty settled that, that it's linked to lots of 
neurodegenerative diseases, you know, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, lots of stuff that happens in the mind later on in life it has a very, up. very strong link. Yeah, and it will catch up. So, so you can do it, but just you have, to have, you have to go into it with your eyes wide open and know that this is the reality of it. It's not a choice that you have because evolution will just take over. You know, your, your body needs this sleep to flush all of the toxins and the chemicals and download your, your memory stick. Um, the, the profile that I see the most, Neil, with, with guys that I work with, and this might, this might resonate with some of your listeners in terms of the people that they coach, um, work really, really hard all day. Um, we, we, we've got two rhythms. We've got a circadian rhythm, which most people know about when we're asleep, and then we've got an ultradian rhythm when we're awake. We have the same rhythm same 90 minute rhythm. Um, now our, our brains are designed for around about 90 minutes of focus. After that, we start to become easily distracted, simple decisions become harder, and we start to go into our stress response. You only need 10 or 15 minutes outside of your 90 minutes to let your brain settle down, let, that, let the frequency slow down, and then you can kind of go again. But most of the clients I work with, they go to work at eight, they, they might have had a couple of glasses of wine the night before, so they've slept, but they haven't got the NREM sleep that they need because the, the alcohol so represses them. starting the day on the back foot already. Starting the day on the back foot, then they'll make poor dietary decisions, which will spike their blood. Um, uh, the, the old myth, you know, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. But I, I believe that breakfast is the most important meal to delay. Um, uh, I think that fasting is, is something that I've done for a long time now, and I feel the benefits of it. But they'll have a... They'll, you know, if you're going to eat a breakfast, you know, you want to eat protein rather than carbohydrate because obviously, as you know, and your guys will know, the, the carbohydrate will spike their, 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 their sugar levels. The way that the body systems are, are designed is we, we, we don't have a, a dial of like 0 to 10. So if, if your blood sugar levels go slightly over the level, as you know, it's a little bit like holding a match to a, to a sprinkler alarm even though you only need a little bit of water to, to put the match out, by putting the match there, it sets the whole system off. Completely. And then they get, then they get their crash. Uh, then they drink more coffee and they get their breaks. They get to the afternoon. They have the, the mid afternoon slump because of the foods they've been eating all day and because of the amount of coffee and the fact that they haven't took any breaks. They get to the end of the day fatigued, absolutely wired, having drunk too much coffee. So they get home and they think, Oh, I'll have a couple of glasses of wine to unwind then the wine affects their sleep and then we start the next day on repetition. Um, and actually, if you convince them that the sleep, they're having the breaks in the day, getting their breakfast right, and then, you know, I'm not saying don't drink, because as you know, I love a beer just as much as any guy, but just understanding that alcohol does repress the sleep that you need. It inhibits you from getting the sleep. That's why when people go out on a big bender, they sleep for 12 hours, they wake up and they're absolutely shattered. And the reason for that is because they haven't got any of the NREM sleep that they need. They've, been, they've had their eyes closed, but they've been moving around in their bed and they've been in that sort of superficial light level of sleep all through the night. Um, so on the face and, of it, these are like, I see them as almost small ninja moves. You know, you can say to, we can say to a learner or a client, you've got to have, um, a, you know, a, a, an evening routine, a, a morning routine, a good night's sleep. You've got to structure your day be more productive within 90 minute segments and on their own there it looks and seems very easy to do yet don't confuse easy to do with this is probably the hardest part of of, of yeah. behavioral change and mindset it, it looks yeah. easy on the outside but actually doing it and taking action and doing the work in those ninja move areas that's the hardest part to to, to get yeah. to get somebody to to, to do yeah, yeah, yeah. The problem with the world is not information, it's implementation. Exactly. For a problem with the world is not information, it's implementation. And that brings us to the end of today's Fit Pro Session, episode three with Phil Quirk. I want to thank Phil. I also want to thank you for listening. And I want to invite you to join us for part two of Phil's interview, which is going to be roughly episode nine in a couple of weeks time, where we deep dive into career change, NLP, as well as answer a number of learner questions from the Parallel Coaching community. I want to thank you for listening today and I'd like to ask a favour. I'd like to ask if you could leave us a review. As you know, Fit Pro Sessions is a brand new podcast and we'd really like to spread the word about what we're doing and reach more fitness professionals just like you. 
I also invite you to learn more from Phil Quirk by going to philquirk.com or his Facebook page, Phil Quirk NLP, where you can learn more about NLP and hypnosis and the work that Phil's doing. All the links are below in the show notes. You can also watch the full interview with myself and Phil on our blog at parallelcoaching.co.uk forward slash blog, as well as download a number of mock questions relevant to your course and learn more about the revision boot camps that we offer. I look forward to seeing you on the next Fit Pro session, episode four. Hi, I'm Neil Bergman. And I'm Hayley Bergman. Over the last 10 years, we've helped thousands of fitness professionals to get qualified, learn with simplicity, and coach clients with confidence. We're the first to say that learning and being a fit pro doesn't have to be hard work, and that with the right structure, support, and resources, you can become a confident and knowledgeable fitness professional that is dedicated to more. So how do you learn, qualify, and kickstart as a fit pro? This is the Fit Pro Sessions podcast with Parallel Coaching.